It's been a while since I've been down there, so maybe there is, I said to myself, and just shrugged it off. It was about 12.30 by then. I still had two and a half hours to my audition, so I decided to take a shower and get dressed. After all, I'd been in the same clothes for two days now. That's kind of gross. I walked back to my bedroom to pick out some clothes. Now, my father has always told me that if you're going for a job interview, you want to look the best that you can. A nice pair of dress pants with a belt, a button-up collared shirt tucked in, a matching tie with a tie clip, black socks, and a pair of black dress shoes. You want to dress for success, son, he always said. But this, this was an audition for a rock band. That corporate suit monkey crap was not going to work in this situation. I went to my closet and pulled out a pair of torn jeans. My blood red give me metal or give me death t-shirt, a studded belt, my black Nikes, and my neon green zebra printed bandana, which I'd fold up and use as an armband. I thought about wearing my black Sabbath jacket, but after what happened last time, I decided against that idea. I decided not to even wear a jacket. Anyway, I gathered my clothes and went to the bathroom to shower. I was kinda skeptical about taking one, since I discovered that flashing number on my right bicep the last time, I was afraid of what else I would find this time. I breathed a sigh of relief after showering and discovering no new issues. I did discover that the cuts on my wrists and my ankles were healing up pretty nicely though. Anyway, I got dressed, teased my hair up a bit to look more rockish, then decided to try and write a song. All I could think about was my date on Friday night with Susan, so I decided to write a love song. Every one of my composition books were full, so I wrote it on a piece of loose leaf paper from one of my high school notebooks. I'll just transfer it over when I get a new book, I thought. It turned out pretty good, if I do say so myself. I folded it up and stuck it in my back pocket. Oh shit, it's almost 2.30, I gotta go, I said aloud, realizing what time it was. I grabbed my keys, my guitar, my amp, and the plug-ins, flew down the stairs, out the front door, threw it all in the back seat, jumped in the car, fired her up, backed out of the driveway, and headed to the audition. As I said before, it had been a while since I'd been to Dead Man's Lane. I actually had to think about how to get there. Right at the end of our road, left on Brentford, another left on Jacobson, around the bend, right on Miller's Pond Road, go up about a mile, and it's on the right. And there it was, Dead Man's Lane, just as I remembered it. A long stretch of road, about four miles long, surrounded by what soon would be cornfields, but now were just dirt fields. I made the right turn and drove slowly down the road, looking for the church. I didn't see it anywhere. Now, if you took driver's ed in school, like I did, then you know that the first rule that they teach you is always check your mirrors. So, as I'm driving along, I check my driver's side mirror. Everything was good. I check my passenger side mirror. Everything was good there too. I then looked in my rear view mirror, and what I saw almost made me shit myself, literally. The mirror showed that the paved road that should be behind me was now a dirt road, surrounded by a dark, fog-infested forest full of dead trees and illuminated by moonlight. My eyes widened as I slammed on the brakes. I turned around to look out the back window and it was just like the mirror's image. I turned back around, now looking out the windshield. I then watched as the dark foggy forest began to engulf my surroundings, eating away the bright sunny day it was before. Now completely surrounded, I sat there, not believing what I was seeing. Out of fear, I quickly rolled up the window. 
What the fuck is going on? I screamed. The wind began to howl, blowing so hard that it shook my car and blew the branches of the dead trees, making them look like they were waving at me. Hell, who knows, maybe they were. The sound of vultures cawing in the distance began filling my ears, even with the windows rolled up. I saw movement in the trees. Suddenly, a black crow slammed hard into the driver's side window, breaking its neck and falling to its death. The sound startled me. I looked to my left, just as the crow was falling. I saw it. The church. Fuck this! I shouted frantically and slammed the car in reverse. Now, I know that I only drove about a half a mile down the road when I first turned onto it. But as I drove backwards through the forest, the road kept going and going and going for at least two miles. I passed the same large dead tree branch three different times. I slammed on the brakes. The car slid to the right, almost hitting a tree. I turned around and there it was again, right in front of me this time. The church. How the fuck is that even possible? I thought to myself. It was beside me. I drove backwards for at least two miles, and now it's right in front of me. I mumbled confused. Okay, I said to myself. I'm dreaming. I have got to be dreaming. Yeah, I fell asleep at my desk. And I'm dreaming all this. Yeah, I gotta wake myself up. Without even thinking, I slammed my forehead on the top of the steering wheel in an attempt to try and wake myself up. All that did was give me a nod on my forehead and a pounding headache for a few minutes. Apparently, I was not dreaming. The church was still right in front of me. The church was a decent sized building made of wood. The wood was all rotting and bowed. All the windows were broken out and there was a huge hole in the roof. The cross that once sat atop of the building had fallen. When it fell, I guess the weight of it, being top heavy and all, caused it to turn upside down and spear itself into the ground. It looked like an inverted cross. I then remembered another bit of wisdom that my father always said, If you want to be a success, sometimes you have to take a chance, son. Yeah, my father, the great philosopher. Anyway, I figured there was no escaping this, so I might as well go check it out. I grabbed the guitar and the amp out of the back seat and proceeded to walk toward the church. The wind almost knocked me over a couple times. I arrived at the doors and pulled them open. The doors were rotting as well, falling off the hinges and covered in dust and cobwebs. I entered the quote-unquote prayer hall and it was just like you'd imagined. Rows of broken pews with ripped up Bibles and pieces of stained glass covering the floor. Strange writings and even stranger symbols graffitied on the walls. At least the parts of the walls that were still standing, that is. Dust and debris made it really hard to see. I walked in a little further, and there, in the back of the quote-unquote church, on the stage where the pulpit should be, sat a long white table with four guys sitting at it, dressed in black and all facing me. The moonlight shining down on the table through the large hole in the roof like a spotlight. The guy on the far right hand side got up from the table and began jogging in my direction. Dude, you made it just in time. Did you have any trouble finding the place? He asked cheerfully. Not really, I replied. He stopped in front of me and extended his hand out to me. I put the guitar and the amp on the ground and extended mine to meet his. Hi, I'm Ricky Blaze. I talked to you on the phone, he said with a huge smile on his face. Hey, 
I replied. I didn't think there was anybody here. I didn't see any cars outside, I said questionably. Yeah, uh, we parked the van out back. There's more space out there, you know, he answered. Oh, I replied. That's cool. We shook hands, as he said. Let me introduce you to everyone. Hey, everybody, he began. This is, um, what's your name again? He asked. I didn't really want to give them my real name after everything that happened, so I quickly decided on a stage name. Mikey Z, I answered. Mikey's here to audition for the new spot, guys, Ricky said to the group. On the far left, Ricky began, is Derek McCobb. He's the bass player. He's pissed off at the world. Derek was skinny, with long black straight hair. He looked pissed off and ready to kill someone. Next to him, Ricky continued, that's Steven Radler. He's our drummer. He's the prankster of the group, so watch out for him, he said with a laugh. Steven was skinny, with long curly red hair. He looked like he was thinking of a way to prank me already. Besides him, Ricky then said, that's Corey Sims. He's our lead singer. He's from California originally. He's into that, that peace and love hippie crap. But damn, can he sing? Corey had a little bit more weight to him than the other two had. He had long, sandy blonde hair and a far-off look in his eyes, like he was stoned. He threw up a peace sign and nodded his head at me. And I'm Ricky Blaze. I play guitar. There's nothing real interesting about me, he said finishing the introductions and then went back to his seat. Ricky was short and kinda chubby, with long bushy brown hair, and reminded me a lot of Jerry Mathers from Leave it to Beaver, but Ricky was kinda cool. I just want to take this time and thank you all, I started to say. Shut up, plug in and play, Derek interrupted in a loud raspy voice. Um, okay, I said. Um, this place is abandoned, so there's no electricity. Um, where do I plug in? I asked nervously. We got a generator out back, Ricky replied. Just plug in over there, and pointed to my right, his left. I headed over to the right side of the church, and there, hanging off the side of the first pew, was an orange heavy-duty extension cord plug. I plugged in the amp, plugged the guitar into the amp, and walked back to the center of the church, right in front of the table, and stood like a rock star. I hit an open E chord, thinking that my hands would just take over, but they did not. I hit another open E chord, still nothing. The four guys just stared at me, with confused looks on their faces. I whispered to myself once again, I want to play like a rock god. Immediately after saying that, my left hand grabbed the fretboard, my right hand grabbed the pick, and again they belted out another incredibly intricate freestyle guitar solo that lasted for about 15 minutes this time. When my hands finally finished playing, Ricky stood up and said, Whoa, dude, that was righteous. You had us worried in the beginning there, but but you pulled it together. You are in. The others just shook their head in agreement. That's awesome. Thank you so much, I said. What kind of metal do you play? Well, we're a cover band right now, but we hope to write our own stuff soon, Ricky said. But But none of us can write lyrics. I can write lyrics. I said, I wrote some just before I came here. I got it right here in my pocket. Want to see? Yeah, he said. I pulled out the song that I wrote for Susan and handed it to Ricky. He read over it and then passed it down to the rest of the band. That's pretty good. You can't go wrong with a nice power ballad. Do you have any more? Ricky said. I got about 20 composition books full of songs at my house. I replied, Cool, bring them to band practice Saturday night. 
8 o'clock. Stephen's parents own a warehouse on the east side. We practice there, Corey chimed in. Ricky already had the address written down on a piece of paper, which I found to be a little odd. But anyway, he pulled it out of his right front pocket, along with another piece of paper with song titles on it. You Got Another Thing Coming by Judas Priest, Ball Crusher by Wasp, Come On Feel the Noise by Quiet Riot, and a couple others. He handed me the paper, I folded it up, and put it in my right front pocket with my keys. You gotta learn these songs by Saturday so we can practice for our first gig next week, Stephen said. A gig? I said excitedly. Cool. Okay, I'll learn them, I said. We gotta get going, man. We'll see you on Saturday, Ricky said, as the band got up and walked through a door just to the left of the stage. I gathered my amp and walked toward the front doors, guitar in one hand and the amp in the other. I'm in a band, I said sing-songish several times over as I did a little dance down the main aisle. I got to the doors and began to pull one open. It fell off its hinges and slammed down on my left foot. Son of a bitch! I screamed out, dropping the guitar and amp as I grabbed my foot. I looked out the door, still holding my foot, and saw the biggest, the blackest, and the ugliest vulture that I'd ever seen in my life sitting on the top of my new Mustang. Hey! I yelled. Get the fuck off my car, you big fuck! The vulture then turned its head to look at me. Its eyes felt like they were cutting right through me. It cawed an evil caw and then flew away. I gathered my things and hobbled out of the church. As soon as my foot hit the ground, the dark foggy forest disappeared and the bright sunny day was back. What the... what? I said confused. I turned around and the creepy abandoned run-down church that I'd just stepped out of was gone as well. The cross was too. I was staring into an empty dirt field. I just stood there in total disbelief. I must be hallucinating, I said to myself. It's got to be a side effect of selling your soul or something, I said. I limped to my car, put the amp and the guitar in the back seat, then pulled the keys out of my pocket. The papers fell out on the ground. Wait, I can't be hallucinating. I still got the papers that Ricky gave me, I said to myself, now even more confused. What the fuck is going on here? I said into the open air. I quickly hopped in my car, started it up, backed up, almost hitting a tree, and then drove away as fast as I could. I drove around for a couple hours, trying to pull myself together before I headed home. When I finally got home, I decided to get something to eat, as I hadn't eaten anything all day. I walked into the kitchen, pulled out a box of Hot Pockets from the freezer, put them in the microwave for three minutes, and then put on a pot of coffee. The microwave timer went off, I took my dinner out of the microwave, got a cup of coffee, and then decided to watch a little TV. Anyway, I walked into the living room and turned on the TV and then searched for the remote. A newscast came on right away. I heard the anchor man say, Our top story tonight, four local teens killed in a freak accident early this morning. I found the remote and then sat on the couch. Witnesses say, the anchor man continued, that the van containing the victims blew a tire. The driver then lost control of the vehicle. It went over the edge of a cliff and plummeted into the rocks some 90 feet below. Holy shit, I said to myself as I bit into the hot pocket. Fire and rescue workers discovered four mutilated bodies in the wreckage, he continued. The bodies were taken to the county morgue for identification. The identities of the victims have just been released. They are 18-year-old Derek Mitchell, Stephen Ramsey, also age 18, Cornelius Simodowski, age 19, and Richard Bellington, also age 19. 
The hot pocket then fell out of my mouth and hit the floor as I stared at the TV screen, my mouth wide open, my eyes not believing what I was seeing. The four pictures shown of the four victims were the same four guys that I just talked to less than three hours ago. Oh my God, I said to myself, I just joined a band and now they're all dead. What the fuck? Wait a minute. The anchorman said that the accident happened early this morning. I talked to Ricky at noon and saw all four of them at three o'clock. What the fuck? I said, I'm in a band with a bunch of dead guys. Fucking cool.